All right, we're going to go ahead and get going. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing okay? okay. Good. Um, thanks for your, I, I say this um, kind of sarcastically, I asked some of you guys to pray last week because uh, my son Colby was had a district basketball game, I asked you guys to pray and your prayers did really well, we were out of it about two minutes into the game, got murdered by about 40 points, so I don't know what that says about us, but um, our prayers sure didn't work, so, but um, I'm going to open us up and say a word of prayer now though. Father in heaven, thank you that you are an amazing God. We thank you that we can learn so much about who you are as you reveal yourself to us uh, through your word, um, through Jesus Christ. And and I hope that as we've read this, I hope that as we study this gospel that um, we see more and more clearly just how amazing um, Christ is. And so, Father, I pray that we fall in love with him more, that we go out and, and we're so impacted that, that we share the good news with other people and, and they don't just come to believe because maybe what we say, but they come to believe because they check out Jesus. And, and so, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for this church. We thank you um, that, that you just speak to us and that you are living and active. And so help us to have eyes that see and ears that hear so that we might grow in our faith and, again, be a light in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. So. All right, we're going to talk about chapters 9 and 10 tonight. Some of my favorite chapters. I love um, this guy. I love the, the, the blind man that was healed. I think he's, um, I, I just think it's cool the way that he handled the Pharisees and the people that were, that were questioning him. And as I was going through it, I thought, it, you know, the guy that got healed by the pool of Bethesda, um, the one that had been an invalid for, what was it, 47, 48 years, whatever it was, 38, there you go. I thought that he was, I, I thought he was kind of a jerk. Did anybody else get that when you were reading through that? When, when he went out and, and they were saying, who was this? And he didn't know. But then once he found out who it was, he went and ratted Jesus out. I don't, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I love this guy more. This guy's more like, do you want to come to believe in Jesus too? Do you want to follow him as well? So I like that. And then John 10, um, my life verse, verse that, that I recite over and over again is John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the full. And so um, these are a couple of my favorite chapters, so we're going to fly through it like we always do, um, and then hopefully your discussions get a little bit deeper than what we go through, but you can just follow along with me. We're going to start here on page one and get moving. So John chapter nine, verses one and two says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And I, I preached on this not too long ago, just for, for a moment in, in my, one of my messages. But, um, you know, there are some things that we simply don't know. And, and this is obviously one of them. People are in conditions. People are in situations. God calls us not to judge because we don't know the situation. We do know from Scripture that, that all of our pain, all of our suffering is caused by sin. Um, we can trace it all the way back to, to, to Genesis chapter 3, the fall. And when the fall came, all hell literally broke loose. Our relationship with God was destroyed. Relationship with other people was destroyed. Relationship with creation was destroyed. So we know that that's at the root of all of the junk that we go through here in this life, the brokenness of this world. But to think that we specifically know what causes situations and suffering and pain that people are in, that would be way beyond our scope as human beings. And so we need to leave that alone and, and trust God in that. And we see this, that even back then people were saying, who sinned? Was it this man? Was it his parents? And Jesus comes onto the scene and says, you got it all wrong. It was nobody in this situation. And as a matter of fact, he was going to use it for his glory and, and for God's good. So um, ultimately, they're all pain and suffering as a result of the fall found in Genesis 3. Sometimes it's our own sin, as I said. Sometimes the sin of others. And sometimes just the fact that we live in a broken world. So to think that this world's kind of like a moral slot machine and we stick a coin in, and if we put a good coin in, then we get good results. And if we put a bad coin in, we get bad results. That would be a lie, and that's wrong. The, the scripture is, is clear and honest that, that sometimes bad things happen to good people, and sometimes bad people get off scot-free and, and never end up having to pay this side of, of eternity. So um, I think that would be something for us to learn to, to keep our mouth shut a lot of times. Instead of trying to find reasons for things, we encourage and we mourn with those who mourn and we, we laugh with those who laugh. So, um, But in the midst of this chaos and misery, 
that sometimes goes on in this world, we know that we've got a loving and wise God, and he is making all things new. And I think that's part of, of one of the themes of the Gospel of John. His kingdom has come. Um, Jesus is in the business of resurrection and the business of new creation. At the beginning, we go all the way back, and we know that the, the world was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, it says in Genesis chapter 1. And, and we see that, that God himself um, created light and brought order to the chaos. And we see in Jesus that he's doing the same thing. While this world is messed up, Jesus is the light of the world. He came and he's bringing healing. He's bringing his kingdom. And the kingdom, while it's not what it will be, the kingdom is at hand. And, and we can live in that kingdom in the midst of all that's going on around us. Um, Jesus says that I, I make all things new. And he's in the business of making all things new. Now we long for the day when he comes back when he sets everything right, and we're to pray for that day, we're to look forward to that day. Um, but in the meantime, the kingdom is still here, battling, it's facing opposition, we, we, we still have testing, we still have sin, um, but Jesus is making all things new. And I think that was part of, of the miracle and part of the situation that, that we hear about tonight. So um, John chapter nine, verse five, it says, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Then in 8, 12, it says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. And that goes all the way back to a theme that, that John set up back in chapter one. It says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So um, again, Jesus is bringing light in, into the darkness. He is bringing life out of death. He's making all things new. He's in the business of resurrection and, and creation. So John chapter 7, as we move on, I mean chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which this word means sent. So the man went and washed and he came home seeing. And again, I just love the faith of this guy. I love kind of the progression that we see in the story. So um, this faith results in, in new creation for this guy. Healing happens, um, and it all happens because of Jesus. And again, we know, we've said this over and over again. John reminds us over and over again um, that he is writing so that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And we see these signs and we see these miracles and, and they point to uh, his authority. They point to who he is. And I think this is another one that says um, so much. So, um, and again, I, I, I love the kind of the spunk and character of, I think, of Jesus as well. He does, I think, many of these things on the Sabbath day. And I think he's doing that for a reason. One, it's, it's kind of showing new creation, all these kind of things. But, but also, I think he's, I, I think he's, you guys agree with me? Don't you think he's ribbing the Pharisees a little bit here and saying, bring it on, let's go? And, and Jesus was getting in trouble all the time. And he never shied away from that. And, and, and he was obviously doing the will of the Father and doing everything perfectly. Um, but, but this brought about um, some problems for him. So uh, people wonder, the blind man gets healed on the Sabbath, which gets him in trouble. We've seen this you know, over and over again in John and the other Gospels. He's, he starts getting it into it with the Pharisees. But, um, but this blind man is brought from darkness to light by Jesus. And I think it's cool when you read it. People were so um, freaked out by this. They, they wondered if, if this man was actually the same man that they had known. And I think that says a lot um, about us, and I might be jumping ahead, but um, even in our conversion, and, and when we have an encounter with Jesus Christ, hopefully people start to wonder, is this really the same person? Is this, is this Herc that I knew? Is this the person that I used to know? And you know, really the answer is no. We, we are brought into newness of life. Um, Second Corinthians says that you know, we're a new creation. And so um, I, I think this, again, is just giving us a pattern and showing us some things. So um, I love this guy, though. He trusted Jesus. He went and did what Jesus said. Um, and, and I think that um, when we look at this, I, I love the, the blind man's reaction. But don't you, and again, you guys tell me, don't you think his parents are creeps? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, think of that. And now, again, there's fear. You know, at that time, um, the Pharisees were clear. If, if people followed Jesus, they would be kicked out of the synagogue. And see, we might look at that from our perspective and think, okay, what's the big deal? You know, say we get kicked out of the church. We'll just go down the street and go to another one. But that was so much different than that was their, it was, it was the center of their lives, the synagogue. They would be kicked out. They would be ostracized from their friends, from family. So this was a huge deal. And so, unfortunately, the parents 
are afraid of, of the consequences of this. And, and I think also then we also see that the Pharisees are acting out of fear as well. They're, fear, they're afraid of anything that's new, that's coming onto the scene, that's going to change um, the establishment, that's going to change Judaism that's been around, that, they, that they've put their trust and their, their, their hope in, and anything that comes new, they're, they're opposed to here. And obviously we're seeing in this gospel that Jesus is all about making this, this new, everything new. You know, the Old Testament, the, the law served its purpose. It pointed towards Christ. But Jesus comes onto the scene and says, I'm making all things new. So, um, so Jesus is a threat to the Pharisees. That went all the way back to the cleansing of the temple we saw in chapter 2. Then in chapter 5, he heals the crippled man on the Sabbath. We could continue on. The disputes continued on in chapter 6, 7, and 8. And they misunderstood what he was saying, but they were constantly... Um, going after Jesus, so much so, and the intensity is increasing that, that we know that ultimately it led to his death. So um, I want to read John chapter 9 there because I just, I just like the story. Chapter 9, verse 20 to 34, it says, We know that he is our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind, but how can he see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. This is why his parents said he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. Isn't that funny? God had actually touched him and they're saying, you know, give glory to God by, by saying that this man is not God and that this guy is actually from the evil one, basically. We know that this man is a sinner, he replied. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. And I love this guy. He says, one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already, and you didn't listen. Why? Do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled it. In. And again, that takes a lot of courage. I mean, remember what, what, you know, the power that these people had, what they could do to him. But he had been touched by Christ and had been changed and, and really had courage that, that obviously his parents didn't have. It says, then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciples? We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the man answered, now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So these guys never listened. Their minds were closed. Um, Jesus had already answered this question. No one had sinned, but again, they were stubborn, hard-hearted, um, almost like Pharaoh in the Old Testament. And, and, and that's why we see over and over again how Jesus has a problem with, with this group. He has a problem with people that think that they've got it all figured out, the self-righteousness, the people that are open, that are honest, that are struggling, Jesus is always patient with. So the man's thrown out, but then we see that Jesus goes after him. And I think it's cool. The man believed. He went and did what Jesus said. He obeyed. He was changed. And then for a while, we're, we're told that the man believed that Jesus was a great prophet. He knew that Jesus had healed him. He believed that Jesus was doing the work of God. So in other words, God had sent him. And eventually he believed to Jesus to be the one through whom God's light was coming into the world. Eventually he believed that he was the Messiah. And he actually bowed down and worshiped Jesus. And this is the final step, I think, that John, as he's writing his gospel, wants all of us to take, that, that, that Jesus is who he says he is and that he is to be worshiped. He is God in the flesh. The word became flesh. So um, others, as I mentioned, noted the change so much so that they weren't even sure it was the same man. And he gave credit to Jesus. He gave credit to Jesus. And again, I just, I, I love the spunk of this guy. Um, he's so much different, as I talked about earlier, the Pool of Bethesda. But, but you know, I, I think in the Gospels and in our lives, we see various reactions to Jesus, don't we? We see some people that when we share Jesus with others or when they hear the good news, some people are intrigued. It piques their curiosity. They check it out. Others believe, actually come to belief, and they follow him. There are some who are indifferent in their lives. They just don't care. They're, they're not in any mood to come to church, not in any mood to, to follow Christ. They think they don't need him. Some, I think, come and, and they really might believe intellectually, but like the parents, they're afraid of the cost. 
which Jesus is clear about, the cost are, are to lay down our lives and to follow him as well. And, and then some we see hate him. So I think as we read these stories, you know, we can expect the same reaction today as Jesus has brought to the people. So um, when faced with fear and anger, we know that the only way through is to glimpse whatever we can see of Jesus and to follow him. He is the light in the darkness, so we follow him. So um, I think Jesus uses this healing point um, to point out the spiritual blindness in the Pharisees. They're blind when it comes to the Sabbath. They're blind when it comes to who Jesus is, um, who sent Jesus onto the scene. They're blind and closed off. They're not even willing to open their eyes. So it's funny that in this story here, and in this miracle, he opens the eyes of a blind man, but the people who are leading um, the Jewish people are the ones that are supposed to see, the ones that are supposed to have the God kind of figured out are the ones that are truly blind. And, um, and their eyes can't be opened because of their, their hard-heartedness. So Jesus is the one who brings light and truth to the world. And the power of lies and evil is very strong, and it's easy to be deceived. And, and we know that Jesus is the way, um, the truth, and the life. So then we move on. I, I, again, love that story. You can talk more about it. But then we move on. And, and basically, at the beginning of chapter 10, Jesus gives us a little parable. And then I think he explains this parable to us in three layers. So I, I want to read some of this in chapter 10. It says, Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So um, if we read through the Old Testament, oftentimes um, God is depicted as a shepherd and this relationship that God has with his people is an intimate uh, um, relationship and, and there's intimate contact between the sheep and between, um, between the shepherd. And we could read, you guys on your own ought to read Ezekiel 34. But, um, so Jesus uses this idea of him being the shepherd to show, um, first of all, I think John's writing so that we might come to know that Jesus, the word became flesh. In other words, again, God is on the scene in Jesus Christ. Um, but, but so he's equating himself with that. But again, it would take people back to this intimate relationship. And I think we see that throughout this passage. So a sign of the real king is a response that comes from the heart, I think Jesus is saying. So people hear the voice and they follow because they love and they trust him. People are seeing Jesus here in his ministry now, and they're, they're following him. And it's a mark that he is the one, that he is the Messiah, that he is, again, the word who has become flesh. He says that, um, that he is the gate, that he lies down. And, and again, this would have gone back, at, I, I guess, back in this time as I read a little bit. They would make, um, maybe they would bring their sheep to caves, or, or they would make some pens, and the, the, the shepherd would actually lay at the entrance to the, to the sheep pen or the entrance to the cave. And he did that for a few reasons. One, to keep his sheep in so that they, they couldn't get out and escape. And then also to keep predators from coming in, to keep the sheep safe. So here Jesus is saying that he is the gate. And again, this idea of intimacy between him and his people, that he's going to watch out for them. He's going to see them as they come in and out. He's going to ward off and protect them from any kind of predators. Jesus came so that we might have eternal life. And we're told that eternal life is, is knowing God, is loving him, and is enjoying him. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it begins now and never ends. So this idea of the kingdom is at hand begins right now, um, but, it, but it, 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 it's not what it will be. But abundant life is offered right now. And that's what John 10.10, I know I'm going backwards a little bit, but John 10.10 says that he comes so that we might have life and have it to the full. Um, and that we might have life in the name of Christ through Christ. So um, again, this, this, this 
closeness that God has and that he offers to his people safety and, and, and love and, and all of those things. So he is the one that fulfills. And John 17, 3, later on, it says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Jesus now, up to this point, he said that he's living water. He stated that he is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. And now he says, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd. So I think we're seeing a clearer and clearer picture um, of this amazing God that, that we know that we serve and that we love. And ultimately, we know that Jesus is, is the ultimate good shepherd because he lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus has been receiving death threats. We've seen this from the Pharisees. They've been looking for ways to kill him, for the religious leaders. And now that we see that death is actually a part of his vocation, that he is the good shepherd and he lays down his life for the sheep and he does it willingly. And I think it's cool also, it says he does that and he lays it down and he's also going to take it up again, a reference to the, to the resurrection. So, um, and then also we see in this the plan that God's had from the very beginning, going all the way back to, to Genesis and to the promise that God made to Abraham, where he said through Abraham's seed, he would bless the entire world. And now we're seeing how this nation of Israel and what they have brought and the knowledge of God and Jesus being an offspring of Abraham is now going to bless the entire world and bring the whole world into a sheep pen, which would have been a revolutionary concept. It wasn't just for the Jews. This was now for everyone, which was God's plan again all along. The good shepherd lays down his life and he's going to take it up again. He's going to defeat every enemy. And John chapter 10 says, Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you were the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my father's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. And I and the father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And, you know, again, that's the point of, of the Gospel of John, is that we come to believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. But, you know, a lot of people in, in today's world will try and tell you that Jesus never said that he was God, that that was his followers that made that up years later and kind of wrote that into the story. And, and it's funny because as we read through it in, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is kind of cryptic, isn't he? Do you, you kind of know, don't, sometimes I do wish he would just answer a question straightforward. Um, but I think it goes back to, to John chapter three, when he was talking to Nicodemus and it says, you know, you don't understand because you've not been born again. You can only understand spiritual things when you've been born spiritually. So I, I think maybe there's a method, obviously there's a method to what he's doing. Um, but, but it's clear to the Jews at least and, and while people today will say, you know, that he never claimed to be God, it sure was clear to these people, wasn't it? Because they picked up stones to stone him because they said, you, a mere man, are claiming to be God. So clearly, as we've read through John so far, and we're going to continue to see it, in many, many different ways, Jesus is saying that he is God, that he and the Father are one, that he is the creator that he's been all along. And, and we see this unfold. And again, it would have been a crazy thought a crazy thing to the Jewish people who had always believed in this, this, you know, this idea of one God, that there's no way a man could be God. So this idea of the Trinity coming to play throughout the Gospel of John here. But much of what Jesus has done throughout the Gospel has been centered around Jewish feasts and celebrations, and we could take many, many more weeks to, to go through all of that. But this is the, feast, the festival of dedication, Hanukkah. And I, I give a little thing. In, in 167 BC, Judas Maccabeus had liberated the temple and reconsecrated it. Earlier, there was a tyrant named Antiochus Epiphanes who had trampled Jerusalem, taken over the temple and desecrated it. He had offered sacrifices to foreign gods, offered pigs on the altar. And, and Judas um, came in and, and basically you know, got rid of him and, and restored some things, started a dynasty that lasted for 100 years. 
When it ended, the Romans made Herod the Great the king. So this is a little history. So he had had these Maccabeans that had ruled the, the Jewish nation for 100 years. Then, then basically Rome puts Herod in charge, Herod the Great. Herod married a princess from the family of Judas Maccabeus to show that he intended to continue the line. But we know the story. He was a fake. He was in it for all himself. He's the one that when Jesus was born, uh, you know, made a decree for all the babies in the vicinity of, of Bethlehem to be killed. So, um, But at this time then, in Han when they're celebrating this victory of, of the Maccabeans, um, they would be thinking about God. They would be thinking about liberation. They would thank God that they had the temple back again. The temple was like the Statue of Liberty, the Mount Rushmore, the monuments on steroids. This, this brought them identity. This was the center of, of who they were, the center of their, their faith, the center of, of their sacrifices. And so they would have been thankful for that. But they were also thinking about kings and how people became kings. And here you have Jesus at this point, and he's coming and basically saying that he's setting up a kingdom, and, and he is a king who is, is much different than anyone would have ever thought, and how he was taking over, and, and the kingdom that he had was, was so different. And so you could see that, that he's saying he's going to be a king like, like a shepherd, and, and, and he's pointing out that many of these other people that had come before him, that they were fakes, they were phonies, they were, they, they were you know, a bunch of thieves and and so Jesus' message, again, as we're seeing over and over again, was, was crazy and got him into a whole lot of trouble. And it was much different than people would have expected. So even here, you can see some of the reactions at this, at this celebration. Jesus coming and saying, you remember that king that took over in a military way. I'm going to be the king that lasts forever, but it's going to be much different. And how he take charge is much different than you would have ever dreamed. So the question that we often see is Jesus is the Messiah. Is he the true king of Israel? And we also see from this passage that Jesus is the ultimate judge. He divides people into two categories, those who believe in him and those that don't. And we know that we're going to see those people that believe in Jesus because God loved the world. They're not condemned. They're, they're raised up. They're resurrected. Eternal life, which we know eternal life is having a relationship with God having a relationship with Jesus, but then there are those who don't believe. And, and ultimately, that's the choice that people make. And those who don't believe, they'll be raised up, but raised up for destruction. And again, I think John is saying, don't, don't go there. Look at the evidence. Look at the signs. Look at the teachings. Look at the miracles and believe in this Jesus. Jesus, we see there, points people to Scripture and to his works. He says that he and the Father are one and ultimately know that this will lead to his death. And we're going to start turning the corner next week because it starts moving towards that final act, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ. So um, um, I just want to finish there by reading John chapter 10. It says, Jesus answered them, it's not written in your law. I have said you are, is it not written in your law? I've said you are God's. If he called them gods to whom the word of the Lord came and scripture cannot be set aside. And I underlined that scripture cannot be set aside. What about the one whom the Father set apart as very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said I am God's son. So you could go back, and I think that's Psalm 82. And it references basically that people um, were gods. They were children of the one God, small gods with a little g. And Jesus is saying, so if Scripture says that about people who, who, are, who come under the, the, the headship of, of the one true God, how much more am I a real God? Why should it surprise you that I am the God, the one sent by Jesus? And again, he says, look at my miracles, look at my words, look at what I've done, and, and look and believe. So um, I hope you guys have some good discussion in a small group, and I'm going to pray one last time here. Father in heaven, just again, may we have um, a reaction like the one who was, was, was healed from his blindness. May our eyes be open. May we give you thanks. May we give you the worship and praise that you alone deserve. Help us to overcome by fear. Uh, help us to overcome our fear by faith. Help us to follow the light of Jesus Christ. Father, we know that you have come so that we might have life and have it fully in the name of Jesus Christ. We know that your kingdom is at hand. While we long for the day when Jesus returns, we can live in the kingdom right now. We're thankful for that. Help us to have soft hearts, Father, and to believe and to love Jesus more and more. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So my group will just kind of meet up here in the front, I guess.